He tore the veil. When Jesus came forth from the tomb and he rose on the third day, it says that the, the veil in the temple tore from the top to the bottom. That tells me that God reached up there and ripped that veil so you and I could have free access to him. And there was nothing we did and there was nothing we could do. He did it. And so why in the world would we live our lives stressing out, striving so much to try to live a perfect life, to try to do this or that so we can just somehow get a forgiveness and get favor with God when he already did it? He already did it. He already accepted us just like we are. That doesn't mean he wants to leave us like we are. We know that's not right because we're all messed up. I, I don't know if you know, look, look around at the people around you. These are some messed up people in here. And the most messed up one is up here talking to you right now. So, so there's nothing we could do. God did it. He made a way. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that worth shouting over? Some of you want to shout, don't you? Father, we thank you so much that you did it. You made the way. Jesus, you freely on your own gave your life. No one made you do it. No one compelled you to do it. No one twisted your arm and forced you to do it. Things could have continued on like they did, but you chose really to give your life for us, knowing that it would be the one sacrifice once and for all, for all mankind, those that have come before and those that will come after, that all of us will bow one day, not before governments, not before pastors, not before our bosses, not before our parents, but before you, the name of Jesus is the only name. It's the name above all names that all mankind must give an accounting and bow before one day and say that you, Jesus, are Lord. Every, every murderer, every adulterer, every thief, every war criminal, every mass murderer, every serial killer, every corrupt politician will bow before you one day. Even Satan himself will have to bow on his knee and look up to you and say, you, Jesus, are Lord. You are Lord, not me. And so, Father, we want to resign our position as God of our lives and turn over to you the throne that is rightfully yours. And, Father, I pray at this moment that if there is someone here that has still sitting on the throne of their own lives. God, that there would be something in this time that would make them see, God, that the scales would fall from their eyes, that they would be able to see how loving and graceful you truly are. The sacrifice you made for us, not just to have eternal life, not just to one day barely walk into heaven saying, thank God I made it, I just barely made it. Know that you want us to have the best right now. You didn't just die so we could walk into heaven. You died so we could have life and have it more abundantly. And we thank you for that. You are a good, good father. And we praise you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Hey, before we sit down, would you just give the Lord one more good praise? Maybe a shout or a, a hand clap or something. Yeah. Isn't he worthy? Wow. You guys can have a seat. I'll be honest with you, I, I struggled a little bit this morning and uh, about this message. We're, we're, this is your first time to Living Word Church. I know uh, Gerald already mentioned about the card. If you would, please fill that out. And, and, and don't just give it to somebody. Give it to guest services out there in the hallway. And they do have a gift for you. Uh, and, and they have some information about the church. And, and, but, but I don't want to get lost in that. We're in the third part of a series called Having God's Best. And if you weren't here the first couple of weeks, you can get on our website or we have a, uh, an app for your mobile phone that you can, you can watch the messages online. You can find out lots of information about the church on, on that way. It's real easy. I actually watch my own sermons. I know that sounds kind of narcissistic, but I actually do it to make sure I didn't say anything stupid that I need to apologize for. Because that does happen. People are laughing because they know, yeah, Mark does that quite often. And so um, I watch them myself, and I watch them on my phone, so it's real easy. But this is our third week, and, and the, the first couple of weeks have had kind of shocking titles. The first week, uh, we gave out free beer and pizza. If you weren't here, you missed it. Sorry. Um, we're not doing it again. And you, some of you are going, really? I, I like this church. I'm going to come back to this church. And we actually did, but it was root beer. 
And, but it was pizza. So, uh, but, but the point of the message was we talked about giving and that anything that is given to you, anything that is free it, to you costs somebody something. You know that, right? Nobody gives you a gift, and, and, and it might not have cost you anything, but it costs them something, right? And we've experienced the greatest gift of all, uh, Jesus Christ, forgiveness, salvation for our souls. And, and he, he paid for it, and that's why we're, we wanted to talk about that. But we talked about finances a little bit and giving, and, and it was the hardest sermon I've ever preached because I hate talking about money. I really do. I'm not one of those kind of preachers. And then last week, our message was having uh, uh, the best sex. And if you weren't here last week, you missed that too. So, uh, I mean, just saying. And so you can go online, and you can catch up, and you can watch it. And it really wasn't as, as uh, bad as you might think it was. We talked more about marriage. But today we're going to not be so... Um, so scandalous, I guess, is the word, or shocking. Today is just having God's best family. Because all of us have family. And, and, and so we want to have the best family that we can have. And I want to say something about our church for a minute. Uh, this church is a family. And so welcome to the family. If this is your first time here, you are welcome to the family. And uh, we're, we're, we don't believe we've got the, the, the best church or the biggest church or the greatest church in the world. But I do believe we have the most loving church in the world. I truly believe that, and, and so it's, a, it's an awesome place, and we hope that if you don't have a home church, you'll come back. If you do have a home church, please go serve at your home church. We're not about taking people from other churches. We're not in competition, people. Y'all know that, right? If, we're, if you're a follower of Jesus, we're all on the same team, that at this moment all around the country, all around the world, there are people worshiping the same God that we worship. And so we're all together in that, right? Uh, Michael shared with us this morning that he had 12 salvations at a ministry. He serves that during the week on Friday night. And we glory in that. Isn't that awesome? Uh, shouldn't we just give God praise for that? You're like, well, I don't know those people. It doesn't matter if you know them. God knows them. God knows them. And so it's awesome. And they're our brothers and sisters, so thank you. But the key verse for this whole series is found in Philippians chapter 2. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. We'll put it up on the screen. And uh, this is Apostle Paul writing from jail, by the way. Uh, saying, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. And this has been the key verse for this whole series, and we have at least one more week to go in this series. I'm still, normally I have it planned out better, but I've kind of been trying to just follow the Spirit in, in this one. And, uh, but my question to you is, can, can you put that verse back up for a minute? Put it back up there. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. What would happen if followers of Jesus, us, actually did that? I mean, think about it. What would happen if all of us, just us, not, not the church down the road, but all of us in this room decided, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to start putting other people's interests before myself. I'm going to value other people greater than me now that doesn't mean they're more valuable than you that's not that's not what that paul's saying paul's saying but treat them like they're more valuable than you and you like that don't you you love it when you go to a restaurant and they they wait on you and you have a really good waiter or waitress and they act like you're the most important person in the world you like that don't you you go to a hotel or something where they just say can i do anything else for you can i help you in any other way customer service people know that's the key to make people feel more valuable than they really are necessarily and that's the key, and that's what Paul's saying. So what if we really did that? And I want to tell you something. It can happen. The early church got this right. The early church got this right. Before Jesus came along, there was no compassion in the world, really. Women and children were treated as a commodity. Especially little girl babies were treated as less than human. And many times they would just be left out on a doorstep to die. And, and we think, wow, it's bad now. It's hard now to try to treat people like they're more valuable, like, like we care more about them. You can't, we can't even imagine what it was like in the first century. That women were property. Women were, were considered less value, valuable than men. And the only reason boy babies were valued is because then you had an heir to carry on your name. That's why that was really important. And if a family didn't have any boys, they were almost considered cursed, Right? And that something's wrong. I can't have a boy baby. What's going on? God must not love me or something. But little girl babies were just discarded. And then, the, then Jesus came along and changed all that. And Paul amped it up a little bit. 
And then the church got it right and they decided, okay, we're going to do what Jesus really says. And they started picking up these babies and loving them and caring for them. And you know what happened? The culture around them changed. Not by might, not by power, but by compassion, by love. You know, the Roman Empire, who was, which was considered no way it could, be, it could ever fall, that, that Rome was the world. Rome was the power forever and ever. The Roman Empire was destroyed not by an army, but by compassion and love. That when people now, you go to Rome, you see what? All over Rome, crosses everywhere. And that cross doesn't represent a bunch of people that were killed. It represents one person that gave his life on, on that cross for our salvation and that we would learn his way is a better way. Yeah. And that's what changed the culture. And I believe it can still change the culture today. Yeah. Instead of the world knowing what we're so against as followers of Jesus, what if the world heard about what we're for? That we're for love. We're for compassion. We're for being gracious. We're for generosity. We're for caring for people that need help when, when we maybe we don't. We're for people that maybe the world would kind of throw away and say, you know, you're, you've done too much bad, but we don't believe that way. See, that's what I love about this church. This church has the greatest sinner of all time leading it. That's me. And you go, okay, you're a pastor. You know, how bad could you be? You don't know how bad I was. My wife still rolls her eyes when I tell her some of the stories from my past. God can redeem anyone. God can save anyone. And God can use anyone. There's no one outside of the grace of God. There's no one outside of God's reach that God can't say, I can straighten you up and I can use you for my purposes. And, and Donna doesn't like it when I share a lot about my history, and I won't. But, but it's, not, it's online. It's on the Internet. You can see all my story pretty much. I've lived a lot of my life in drugs and alcohol and in anger and, and spent some nights in jail, you know. And so I have a, I have a, a, a sincere compassion for people that are addicted and, and people that have had a rough time, whether it's family or whatever. And, and, and I understand that. And I also understand going to a church when people would look at you and just say, you're not dressed right. That's why I don't necessarily wear a suit, you know. And if this, this offends you, I, I'm sorry, kind of, and I'm not really sorry. I'm, I'm just, I just want to make you feel better, I guess. Uh, I'm not really sorry, but I, I'll wear a suit sometimes. You know, I can do that, but it's not about that, man. It's about, it's about your heart. It's about, I don't know how to communicate, really. It's, I have all this stuff inside of me, and it's not coming out right. Maybe I should just reboot. Can we start the track again, Brian? I mean, it's like, come on. It's like, it's not about that. And if, you, if you've been to a church where they look at you kind of down because you're not wearing a certain thing, man, I'm just telling you, pray for them. Don't hate them. Don't talk bad about them. Don't, don't beat them down the road. Just pray for those people, man, because I, I just want us to be like Jesus. That's all I really want. That's what I want for you. I want you to be like Jesus. Yeah. And I want to be like him. Okay, let's get into the message. So, so. If we really started doing this, I just think that things would totally change in our culture and in our lives. And it's really counterintuitive. It's not what we think. It's not natural to us. It's really not. We think we're really loving, compassionate people. But when it comes down to it, we're really pretty selfish people. I mean, we really are. Because don't we just say, well, I want to watch what I want to watch on TV. I want to eat where I want to eat. I want to go watch a movie at the theater I want to watch or, you know, I want to rest. I don't want to go meet with somebody. I don't want to go have dinner with somebody. I don't want to do this. I don't want to, right? We do that a lot. It's just kind of the way we are. So it's counter, uh, counterintuitive. It's just not, not natural for us. But our minds need to be renewed. Romans chapter 12 says, be, re be renewed by the, trans transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, we have to start thinking differently, and we can't make ourselves do that. So we have to ask God through the Holy Spirit say, God, just change my mind. I can't do it on my own, so would you do that for me? And so we've been talking about these important things, money and, and marriage last week, and today we're going to talk about family. And I, I really feel like the reason we need to talk about these things is because these are the things that are most important to us. It's the things that, that war against us the most, the money, how we spend our money, our money... How does it control us? And if, if, you, if you weren't here for the first week, my, my main point of the, the sermon, a lot of people heard me say, don't tithe, and that, that was probably not really what I meant to say. But, but what I want is, I don't want your money to control you. I want you to control your money. 
I want you to tell your money what to do. I don't want your money telling you what you can and can't do. You got that? Y'all understand what I'm saying when I say that? I want you to be a master of your money, not your money to be a master over you. And the same with marriage. But today I want to talk about family. And there's three points that I want to make today. Uh, first is marriage precedes children in priority. Now, if you're sitting here today and you're saying, I'm not married, so this is not for me. Hang on. It is for you. Um, it really is. Marriage precedes children in priority. We talked about priority last week. And, and, but it's really easy to get this wrong, especially when you have young children. But you need to understand something. Children are a temporary assignment. Any, any people that are empty nesters in the house, we're empty nesters, right? Children are a temporary assignment, aren't they? They won't live with you forever. And you parents that are not empty nesters and you think that my kids are going to be with me forever, um, they won't be. They really won't be. Eventually, they'll grow up and move out. Now, they might move back in, but that, that's your choice. <laughs> Some of them, yeah. Um, the relationship, your relationship with God and your spouse has got to be the basis of your family. In other words, your family has to revolve around the marriage, not your marriage revolve around the family. And often our marriages revolve around the family, around the kids and around the in-laws and around the you know, other brothers and sisters and whatever. But that's not God's plan. God's plan is that the marriage is the nucleus of the family and that everything else should revolve around that. And healthy disciplines and traditions will breathe life into your marriage. Things like a date night. You know, and, and, and you, you might say, well, my kids are young. We can't do that. Yeah, you can. You can find a sitter for a couple of hours and go eat dinner, have a date night. And you need to do this regularly. Our daughter and son-in-law have figured this out. They, they figured it out at an early age that even though their children are little, they have regular date nights. And I don't know how regular it is. I don't know if it's once a month or it seems like it's at least once a month. And sometimes more often, I think, they have a regular date night where it's just them, not the kids, and, and to have a family night. You know, if you have kids at home, have one night a week where there's no TV, no internet, and you play board games. Some kids don't even have a clue what board games are anymore. I mean, really, they're like, that's just a game where I'm bored. No, it's actually a board. You unfold it, put it out on the table, and you move pieces, and you don't do like this. It's amazing. It's really cool. Um, so do those kind of things. But you've got to budget also your time and your energy. Don and I counseled a couple one time that... Um, their biggest issue was time. And this was a blended family. Uh, both had been married before. He had kids. She had kids. And, but they struggled with time more than anything. They both were very active in their church. Nobody here, nobody you know. Um, and very active in their church. Both loved God, loved to serve in the church. And it actually caused them a problem because they both wanted to serve so much. And so we challenged them to do a budget, a calendar, take a calendar and budget their time. Put on the calendar each and every day what they needed to do from this time to that time. And they came back, I don't know, a month or a couple of months later and said, this has changed our lives. I mean, it didn't matter. The money and, and all those other issues seemed to get worked out when they budgeted their time and said, we're going to spend this day doing this from this time to that time, and you can go to the gym at this time, and I'll go to the gym at this time, and those kind of things. And it changed their life, and they're still happily married today because of that. And then the last thing, you've got to protect higher priorities from lower ones. You've got to protect higher priorities from lower ones. In other words, your marriage is number one. Now, now let's not talking spiritual things for a minute. God's number one. We understand that, right? Your relationship with Jesus Christ is above all, even above your marriage. I'm talking non-spiritual things for a minute. Your marriage, your spouse has got to be number one. And you have to protect that high priority from lower ones. In other words, children. How many of you know children will divide and conquer a family? Yeah, right? They will divide parents, right? Mom said I could do this. What do you say? Well, you know, whatever. And You know, mom's a good, good cop and dad's the bad cop. Or, or dad's the good cop. In our house, I was the good cop. Mom was the bad cop. Because I just like to have fun and play and go do stuff and spend money. And sometimes mom would say, we can't do that. We have no money. We can't go to Florida and we can't do this, you know. And it's like, well, you know, we'd go if mom would let us, but mom won't let us, you know. And I mean, they, don't do that. You just can't do that. And, and so you, gotta, you, can't, you can't do that. But you've got to protect higher priorities from lower ones. Number two is unity is essential. Unity is essential. Unity brings power and potential to your marriage, but it takes work. Mark chapter 3, verse 25 says, if a, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. This is Jesus talking. 
And Amos 3.3, you've heard this before. Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? This is the New Living Translation. I really like the way it says that. Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? It's very practical. It's just practical. Me and Cameron say, hey, let's go to the store. And we don't talk about where we're going or how, which way we're going. He starts going that way and I'm going that way. It's just not going to work. It's just practical. And it's the same in a marriage. If you don't agree about things about parenting and money and, and time and all those things and your values... It's not going to stand. You're going to have problems. And that's where a lot of us are. And I know some of you are going, okay, did you call him this week and tell him what was going on? No, it's just the way we are. We've got to be willing to be unified. And always provide, uh, present a united front to your children. Back to the good cop, bad cop thing. When Donna and I finally really, and we got counseling and got help in our marriage, when we started getting this right, it changed everything. Because the kids, we had three kids that knew how to push our buttons and what wouldn't work and what wouldn't work. And some of your kids are going, oh, crap, he's giving out all our secrets. But listen, you, you need to understand as parents, you have to present a united front to your children always, even if you don't agree. Even if you don't agree and you're saying, well, that's lying and being hypocritical. No, it's not. You go behind closed doors and then you discuss what you didn't agree on. But you always present a united front to your children. Don't ever let them see you divided in any way, shape, or form. And we, did, and we finally did that, and, and, and the kids started figuring out, I can't play mom and dad anymore because they're, they're like a two-headed monster. You know, they're just the same, same in one body. It's just crazy. Also, never allow a significant difference in, in how you give love or enforce different, uh, discipline. Now, children are different. And sometimes, you know, you can say, I'm always going to parent them exactly the same. I'm going to discipline them the same. They're going to have the exact same rules. It's going to be the exact same. It's really, really hard to do that. You, you might can pull it off. We never pulled it off. But you never have a significant difference in how you express love to them. All of our kids knew we loved them. We, they knew we loved them equally. Now, our oldest son thinks that he's the favorite. He thinks that, that his mom loves him more than the rest of the kids. And that's okay. He can think that. But it's not the truth. I may, I'm actually, I kind of guess, if I had to guess, they probably all think they're the favorite, really. And that's okay, because, you know, we're God's favorite, right? Right? Uh, I don't know if you know this. You're God's favorite. Yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? And, and just so you guys are not left out, you're God's favorite. You know, it's just the way God is, and we can't comprehend that. But you can't let a significant difference come in how you enforce discipline or, or show love. And go outside of your marriage for counseling if you need help. Go outside of you. Don't be ashamed. Listen, counseling is not a, sh a sign of weakness. It's a sign of wisdom. And, and I, I freely admit that Don and I had counseling because I want to help people. I want to help people have better relationships. And so if I sit around and go, you know, we've always had it together, then, then you kind of go, well, I can't be like that. Listen, we were that close to divorce at one point in our lives, probably a couple times. But I remember one time in our, in our marriage, we were, I mean, close. I mean, it's like really, honestly, I kind of thought, this is it. We're done. It's, this, we're not going to rebound from this. But listen, you don't know it all. I, I'm, I'm sorry if there's some of you in here that think, you know, I know everything. I'm the smartest person in the world, and I can solve every problem. I, I got bad news for you. You can't, and you're not. You don't know everything. And it doesn't hurt to go outside of your knowledge to get help. And that can be a counselor. It can be a pastor. Uh, don't go to your buddies. Uh, ladies, don't go to your friends, you know, over dinner. Don't, don't do that. Because it will just be a bashing party and the same for the guys. I, I've heard guys get together and say, you know, you just need to find you another one. That, that's not good godly counsel, by the way. So don't do that. And I want to talk to blended families for a minute. That for those of you that have been married before and maybe you share children, you, however that works, you know what I'm talking about. Each parent must have ownership of the children. And here's what I mean by that. It, it's, it's always wise that the biological parent does the discipline. Cer discipline certainly first, early, early in the relationship, okay? I'll say that. Early in the relationship, always a good idea of the biological parent to, to be the head of that. But the non-biological parent must have ownership in parenting and disciplining that child. And they must, that child must know that they have ownership in it or that child will run over them. It's not, a, it's not a surprise that Don and I, and you guys know, that know her story, know that both of us have been married before. I won't go into that. But when we got married and had a blended family, uh, 
our kids knew that the other one had no ownership. The other spouse had no ownership. And so they could just treat either one of us any way they wanted to and knew that we were just like, I can't do anything with this. Even our, our, par- our parents were kind of that way. Knew that, you know, he's just one that came into the family and we'll tolerate him, but we don't really have to listen to him. And that's a huge mistake. It's a huge mistake. So you must share ownership. And don't communicate through your children either. Listen, if you're, if you're divorced, you're separated or whatever, and, and you have children, you have a, a, an ex-spouse or someone that you're, you're dealing with, don't ever communicate through your children. Never, never do that. If you're not man enough or woman enough to co-parent your children, then, then get a mediator. But don't ever use your children to be the messengers of what's going on. Don't ever, ever do that. And, and the language that we speak, this is all part of unity, and that's why I say this a lot. Uh, unity is work. And in a church or a family, it's the same. We, we strive in this church. We strive and strive to have unity. And sometimes we have a lot of meetings. And I don't like to have meetings just to have meetings, but I like to have unity. And so if we can have a church meeting and I can say the same thing to everybody at one time, then everybody hears the same thing, then we have some unity. But if I tell this one and that one and that one, eventually it's all going to get just confused and nobody's going to feel like they heard the same thing. So you've got to work at it, but you've got to use the same language. So you say, these are our children. These are our children. These are not, well, those are his children and my children, or those are her kids and my kids. Don't ever say that. They're our children. They're ours. Our kids have always been our kids. They've never heard anything from us but son or daughter. They've never, step has never, the only steps ever been in our house were the ones that went down to the basement. That's it. Never been another step in our house. And there never will be. And they're our kids. And you need to use that language. They need to be our children. And I said last week when we were talking about sex, if you have a problem in your sexual life, then it's we have a problem. It's not I have a problem or you have a problem. We have a problem. And we're going to work it out together. And same thing. Third point is parenting takes faith. Parenting takes faith. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Train a child, not beat a child. Train a child, not discourage a child. Train a child, not browbeat, not humiliate, not manipulate. Train them. When you start a job, they train you how to do the job because they want you to do the best job, don't they? And that's how it is with children. You want children, parents, I know this about you. You want your children to be great, successful adults, don't you? Of course you do. Well, you train them to be successful adults. And here's something maybe some of you never heard. You're not raising children. You're raising adults. You're raising adults. They're little adults. They're young adults right now. They're very small, maybe adults. They're maybe a little bit bigger. But you are raising adults. And if you can have that picture in mind, that I'm raising these, these little people, we'll call them, to, to grow up and be successful adults, then you, you've got half the battle won right there. That my end goal is that when they, when they move out of the house, when they go to college, when they get married and they have their own family, that I can look at them and say, man, look how successful they are. Look what a great job they are. What great parents they are. See, that's the greatest goal. Honestly, I think it's the greatest compliment for a parent is that your adult children are successful. And I don't mean money-wise. I mean that they're good parents, that they're good people. I think that's the greatest reward of being a parent and honestly we did so much wrong in parenting but I look at my kids now that are all grown all about 30 or more and I go wow they're all awesome adults you know so we didn't do it all wrong but man thank thank God that God was involved in so much of that it takes faith it takes faith and and here's the other thing don't give up don't give up don't think your kids ever gone too far from God to get a hold of them and, and use them and straighten them out. Don't, don't ever give up. Don't ever quit praying for your kids. Listen, I know sometimes you, if they're teenagers, you're praying for them a lot because they're you know, starting to drive and, and, and you know, crazy things and, and you're worried. And so you pray a lot. But pray from the beginning. Pray from when they're babies. You know, we saw a family up here a couple weeks ago dedicating their child. And I asked you guys to pray for that child and the whole family. And pray for them from the beginning. You know what some of you parents should do for your kids that are young? Right now, I know this seems weird, you should pray for their husband or wife. You should start praying now for your child's husband or wife. And you're like, I don't even want to think about them dating, much less getting married. Are you kidding? Listen, don't you want them to grow up and they're going to marry somebody. They're going to be with somebody. 
Don't you want them to grow up and be with a godly man or a godly woman? I know you do. So start praying for them now. That God would set aside a man or a woman for them and keep them pure and keep them focused on God and and protect them and let them have a a good mind and and have good integrity and character so that when they come along that it it will be the perfect person that God has chosen for your child. And I know you want that for them. I want to say a couple more things and then I'm going to move on to something else. But Your marriage creates the level of health and success that your children will attain to. It does. The health of your marriage will determine the health and success of your children. And here, here's, a, here's a key thing. How will your children succeed if you don't show them? How can your children succeed if you don't show them? Do you think the youth pastor is going to straighten them out? They get an hour with them a week, maybe two. Do you think they can, they can really work miracles in your children's life? You have more influence over your children than anyone's, anyone will ever have. You have more time with them. And how will they succeed in life if you don't show them? And you have to show them. You can't just tell them. You have to show them. And here's the thing that when Donna and I went through counseling, I'll never forget, um, I think it was a counselor that asked me this. Do you want your children to be like you? Do you want your children, Mark, to be like you when they grow up? Do you want them to be like you? And you know what? I did what some of you guys are doing. I went, no, no, I don't. I I do not want my children to be like me. And that rocked me. It rocked me to the point of like, I want to be able to someday, I can't say it today, but I want to someday be able to say, you know what? I wouldn't mind it if my children turned out like me. And you can start today making the changes in your life, following God, to the, where, to the point of one day where you can honestly say, you know what, I would love it if my kids turned out like me. I mean, I want them to be better than me, but, but if they turned out like me, if the worst they turned out is like me, then that wouldn't be too bad. And honestly, I can say that today. If my kids turn out like me, I mean, honestly, I want them to be so much better than me. I know that they can, and in a lot of ways, they already are a lot better than me. Certainly at the age in they are in life, they are better than me. But if this is the best they ever get, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. And if you can't do that, you can make a change today that the time can come sooner rather than later that they can be like you. I want to I change gears just a little bit and talk about iniquities. Now, iniquity, an iniquity, some of you may have heard that before, not realized what it was. You're just saying, well, it's just a sin. It's just a fancy gospel word or Christian word or Bible word for, for sin. <laughs> um, if some, maybe if I need to say the sin, <laughs> a little bit, so you guys get in with it a little bit. Are you guys awake? Yeah. All right. Um, so, iniquity is not just a sin, but it's a tendency towards a sin that is taught. It's a tendency towards a sin that is taught. In other words, more is taught than caught. You learn how to sin. And we, we look at little babies and we go, oh, they're so sweet, they're so sinless. And yeah, you leave them alone for a couple of minutes, see what happens, right? They're up on the counter dragging out dishes out of the pantry or whatever, right? And, and, but an iniquity is something that is taught. And that's why we see so many families that seem to share the same sin for generation to generation to generation. My grandparents did it. My parents did it. I do it. My kids do it right? That's what an iniquity is. And some of you go, it's just the way we are. There's nothing, we can't change that. That's not true. That's an absolute lie. But see, God wants to bless us, but his his love is constant, but his blessing is conditional. But God's love is constant. But he says in Exodus 34, 7, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Wow, that's hard, isn't it? That God's going to parent the children to the third and the fourth generation. But what you don't realize is that when God says that when you break that iniquity and you decide, I'm going to live in God's blessing, I'm going to live under God's authority, that you break that and God says, I can bless you for the thousands of generations. 
So there's God, yeah, a couple people like that. God, there's God's grace in the Old Testament saying from the very beginning, say, yeah, I'm going to punish people. You think people are getting away with sin? They're not. They're not going to get away with it. Matter of fact, I'm going to punish them and their children, third and fourth generation, but you can stop it, and God can pour out his blessing for thousands and thousands of generations. You can be the firewall of the iniquity in your family today. You can say, I'm not going to allow this iniquity. I mean, I saw it through my great-grandparents, my grandparents, my parents. I've done it, but I'm going to stop it right here. It's not going to pass down to my children. That iniquity is not going to go any further than me. And that's really worth shouting over right there, I just think. You can stop it. You can be the firewall for the iniquity in your family today. So I have some questions for you, for for the grandparents and parents that influenced you. Were the things that they did biblically sound? Were they morally correct? Were the things that they did, the things that they practiced, how they handled conflict, how they handled other people, how did they handle their relationship with God or not have one, and, and family issues, was it biblically sound? Was it morally correct? And you, you know the answer. You can look back and say it wasn't. It wasn't at all. The second thing is, do you practice those things? Do you do the same things that your parents did? Or possibly you've gone to the other extreme. You said, you know what, I'm not doing that. I'm going to get so far away from that. I'm going to the other side of things. But what you're doing is just as bad. It may be the other extreme, but it's just as bad. And do you practice those things? And the third thing is, have you dealt with it? Have you actually dealt with the iniquities in your family? And here's some ways you can, you can think about things. When somebody talks to you about your family, maybe it's a spouse or somebody else, and, and you're talking about your family, your parents, your grandparents, your brothers, sisters, whatever, and the things come out of your mouth and you say things like, well, you know, our family has always done that. Well, we've just always been this way. Donna won't mind me sharing this. One of the things that when we got married, uh, Donna, like, Donna really talked loud. I, I'm being really generous because she's close enough to throw something and hit me with it. She talked really loud. And, and, and I remember saying, why are you, especially in an argument, why are, you, why are you yelling at me? I'm not yelling. Well, my family's just always, we've just always been yellers. And that's just the way it is and that's the way it's going to be. We've always been yellers. And that's, the, that's how you notice that we have iniquity in our family. Now, yelling, maybe yelling's not a big deal, but I know people that have had other issues where maybe you've said things like, I'm just not going to be poor, and so you hoard money or whatever it is. But have you dealt with it? Four things you can do. Recognize that you have a problem. Recognize that this iniquity is in your life. Second thing is take responsibility for it. Listen, many of us, we don't like taking responsibility for things. But you can't keep blaming your parents and your grandparents. At some point, you got to say, no, I can make a decision to change this. I'm going to take responsibility for it. Third thing is forgive. Just forgive. Forgive your parents. Forgive your grandparents. Maybe, maybe they're, they're a product of, of their environment and how they were raised. And maybe they never heard something like this before. So you got to forgive them. you just got to forgive them. And then the fourth thing is turn it to Jesus. Just turn it to Jesus. Let him take care of it. The last thing I want to talk, no, not the last thing, but the next to the last thing. I'm almost done. Is inner vows. Inner vows. An inner vow is a self-directed promise resulting from an unpleasant experience. A self-directed promise resulting from an unpleasant experience. When I was young, we were, we were very much on a roller coaster. And sometimes things would be good, but a lot of times things were bad. My mom raised us. She was a single mom. My dad died when I was real young. and We didn't have much money. You know, back, back then, I mean, it was, it's hard now as a single mom. It's, but you can imagine 40, almost, well, 50 years ago, um, 45, 50 years ago when I was a kid, um, how hard it was for a single mom to raise three kids. You know, it was really tough. We didn't have much money. And I remember just having a few clothes. And, and I love to buy clothes now. I mean, I do. And Donna loves to buy me clothes. And I always take them. And I have a closet full of clothes, you know. And I remember thinking, I, when I grow up, I want to have more clothes. I want to have more than one or two pairs of jeans and this ratty old shirt that I have to wash every other day to wear. And, and maybe, maybe that may seem petty to you, but have you ever made a comment like, I'll never be poor? I'll never be poor. I'm never going to let a woman treat me like that again. I'll never let a man treat me like that again. 
And see, I, you don't think about it, but when you do that, you're making a vow to yourself that I will never or I will always do this thing. And, and it seems like at the moment, that's a good thing to say. You know, I went through a divorce, and, and I think when I, when I remember back to the time when I, say, I said to myself, I'll never let a woman treat me like that again. I'll never let a woman treat me like that again. It seemed like a wise thing. It seemed like a protective thing, like it was a good idea. But what I didn't realize what I was doing was I was becoming God in that area of my life. I was saying in, in that area of life, my life, God, you have no authority over this area. I'm God of this area. You, I'm going to decide who treats me how, not you. Matthew, in Matthew 5, Jesus said, I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. And that's, that's when we think, oh, this doesn't come from the evil one. But that's what I'm saying. It makes you God in that area. If you say, I'm never going to be poor again. Well, you know, I don't think God wants you to be poor. But then you're saying, I'm not going to be teachable in that area. I'm going to control my finances. I'm going to be God over this area. And I don't care what you want to teach me, God. I'm in control of my finances because I've made this vow to myself. And the vow, the promises we make to ourselves will keep above all other promises. You can promise God something, you can promise a person something, but the promises we make to ourselves will keep over all others. I'll never be treated that way again. I'll never be embarrassed like that. I'll never let so-and-so treat me that way. And you just can't do that. So Jesus said, make no oath, repent and renounce it. And here's how you break it. Just ask, ask the Holy Spirit to show you. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you. I've never met anybody that didn't have an iniquity or an inner vow. Never. Everybody's had one and made one. And maybe you just need to ask the Holy Spirit, show me, remind me. That's his job is to remind me of a vow that I made to myself and then repent. Just ask God to forgive you of it and then forgive your parents. Ask him to forgive and help you to forgive your parents. And here's what I want to, I want to close in talking for just a minute about parents and in-laws. And, and I want to talk to children for a minute. Uh, not as, as in-laws, but for parents. Um, you guys want to come up? Kids, I want to ask you a question. What would happen, and we think back to Philippians, our key verse, to value other people before ourselves and put them first. What would happen, kids, if, you came, if your dad, when your dad came home from work one day, you, you went up to him and said, hey, dad, how was your day? And then after a few minutes, you'd have to fan him, wake him up, he said, hey, Dad, how was your day? He said, oh, well, I don't know. Nobody in this family has ever asked me that before. I don't even know what to say right now. And then you took a genuine interest in his life and what was going on in his life. What would happen? Well, he'd raise your allowance, and then he'd start letting you drive the car when you're 15. It's like, I don't know. You don't have a license, but I trust you. And, you know, just be great. Things would work out for you. And, and listen, as, as kids, you're, you're called to obey your parents. But as adults, the Scripture says that we're to honor four things. First is to honor your parents, not obey. As adults, we're to honor our parents. And what does that mean? We honor them. We don't have to obey them. And I know that kind of sounds foreign to you, but I'm talking to adults now. I'm talking to you as married people or adults. You don't have to, you don't have to obey your parents. And when you get married, you're a sovereign unit. You're a nation that stands alone. And your parents might try to manipulate you. Your in-laws might try to manipulate you. And if you've borrowed money from them, they kind of have some right to speak into your life a little bit. But, but for the most part, you don't have to obey them, but you do have to honor them. Second thing is separation. You have to leave to cleave. Scripture says that we should cleave unto one another. And to cleave, you have to leave. There has to be a time of separating yourself from your parents to where you say, Mom and Dad, I love you. I care for you. But this is more important now. This, this is a sovereign unit. Our marriage, our family comes first. And I love you. Third thing is protection. You have to protect your spouse from your parents. This is really hard for many, for, for adult, I'll say adult children, to confront their parents and say, you know, mom, dad, you're not, you're not going to do that. And, and 
again, my parents died when I was young, so I, I never really had that issue. But, but Donna's had that issue a couple times with, with her parents when we were young. And, and there was a time when she had to just call her mom and say, look, we're not coming to every family reunion. You know, we're not going to do, we're not coming down there every Sunday after church. We're not coming to every family reunion. We've got kids that are playing ball and we're busy and, and we're going to come see you when we can. We lo- I love you, but we have to take care of our family first. And it was hard and her mom pouted for a few weeks, to be honest with you. And I don't think she'll watch this anyway, but, 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 but it was hard and she wouldn't talk. But then after a couple weeks, she's like, okay, I understand. And now, now it's great. She calls and invites us, but doesn't guilt or manipulate us and the last thing is that friendship that your parents and your in-laws become really really good friends see that's the greatest thing when your parents or your in-laws can be really really good friends and I feel like we have that with our kids now they're they're like our really good adult friends you know but they gave us some extra special little kids to come around and love us too called grandbabies you know and But the question is, what would you allow your friends to do? I mean, would you allow friends to just walk in your house and start rearranging your furniture? Would you allow them to just take your kids down the road and and get whatever haircut they want to give them? No, you wouldn't do that. Your friends wouldn't even think about doing it, and you would never let your friends do that. And you can't let your parents or your in-laws do that either. This seems like a lot of information, I know, but here's the point. God wants us to have the best family. And there's parameters that God puts on on family units so that the marriage stays intact, that the marriage is strong and healthy, that the children learn from what they see, not just from what we say, that they model what we're doing, not just what we're telling them to do, and that we can have the best family. And you might say today, I I understand for some of you, you're going to say this was an awful sermon because I don't feel like I'm doing any of it right. I feel like I've done it all wrong. I've put my kids before my spouse. I've let my parents run our lives. I haven't confronted, I haven't stood up to them. I'm not showing my kids how to be successful adults and I certainly don't want them to be like me. But here's the good news, that God offers grace and forgiveness. And God offers a second chance. And God offers a third chance. And God offers a fourth and a fifth and a sixth and a seventh. And he offers hundreds and hundreds of chances. So that when you mess it up every day for 365 days a year, on the next day God says, get up, let's do it again. And today's the day you can start doing it the right way. And you can have the best family that God wants you to have. Would you stand with me? Maybe as they play this last song, you... You want to come and spend some time with God and just say, Lord, I just need you to help me. just need you to help me to to be the parent, to be the spouse, to be the mother, father, brother, sister. I want to have the best family. Maybe say, I don't even have a family. I don't have, I'm not married. I'm not even thinking about marriage. Ask God to start preparing you now for the family he wants to give you. See, I don't want this to just be a time when we just sing a song and, and a couple of people come to the altar, and the rest of you guys just can't wait till we get to Zaxby's. Man, I don't want that for you. If that's, if that's what you got out of this, and that's where you are right now, ask God to renew your mind. And that all of us could come in next week and just say, God started doing miracles in my family because I surrendered to Him last Sunday. Today's that Sunday. You can surrender to Him to change His family. Man, I want to challenge you to lead the way. I want to challenge you to humble yourselves. The greatest gift you can give your children is to humble yourselves at the altar of God. And say, I want to be the man that God wants me to be. I've messed up my whole life, but I want to start today being the man that God's called me to be. So if that's you, now's your time. Father, we ask you to move in this place like you've never moved before. God, that you would give us courage to surrender to you and submit our lives to you in every area as families, as fathers, as mothers, as parents, as children. God, that we would have the best family. And Lord, it starts with our submission and our surrender to you. So God, encourage us to surrender to you now in this moment. Now's your time and the altars are open. I know that you have spoken practical truth to us. You've given us encouragement. You've allowed us to experience your presence. 
But Father, we're asking you to do one more thing. Would you allow us to leave this place different than when we came in? God, that we would have courage that we didn't have before. Lord, that we'd have a new, a new vision in our lives and in our hearts for the world that we didn't have before. God, that we would be able to today start putting others before ourselves, knowing that even in the end, it still benefits us. But God, most of all, would you allow us to speak to people of who you are and your grace and your mercy. Maybe it's a waiter or a waitress. Maybe it's a person at a grocery store. Maybe it's the person in the cubicle beside us at work. Maybe it's to our own family today, God, to a, a brother or a sister or a child or a parent that doesn't have a relationship with you. And Father, I pray in this moment for those that are in this room and would be watching online that have not surrendered their life to you as their Lord, as the master of their lives, that they haven't trusted in you for the salvation and forgiveness of their sins. Lord, would you let those people know that they can do that. They don't have to do it in a church. They can do it in their bedroom. They can do it anywhere. They can anywhere and anytime be honest before you and just say, God, I know I've sinned. I know I've failed, but I also believe that Jesus took the penalty for my sin and that I'm trusting in him today for the salvation of my soul. Give me a new life. Forgive me of my sins. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Hug somebody before you get out of here. We'll see you next week.